Welcome to Draft Deeper on the No Ceilings NBA podcast feed. Thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful Monday morning edition of the show. We are recording this a little bit early on a Friday morning, fresh off the NFL draft. That was a wild night in the world of football. If anyone out there is listening, fan of football, crazy day one of the NFL draft. But if you are watching on YouTube or any of our video sources, you will notice I am not joined this week by Stephen Gillespie or Maxwell Baumbach. I have a very special guest for this episode of Draft Deeper. You would know him as a member of the G League Ignite program. The last two seasons has played a role as a point guard, a communicator, a teacher on this squad, someone who knows these prospects as well as the program inside and out. Pooh Jetter is joining me on this episode of Draft Deeper. Pooh, what's going on, man? Man, first of all, I, I'm on the West Coast, right? So I'm going to say good morning. <laughs> uh, but nah, man, thank you uh, for inviting me on your show. You feel me? So, hey, man, thank you for the opportunity. Oh, come on. And anytime, anytime a, a player, a coach, an executive wants to join us on this podcast, we are always, always welcoming anyone in the basketball community to help give us some insight that either we don't get on a day-to-day basis or things that you know, our audience isn't necessarily absorbing on a day-to-day basis. Just a different different insight, different level of opinion. Always happy to have it on the show. So, Pooh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself just to start off the podcast, get our feet wet. Who Who is Pooh Jetter on the court and who is Pooh Jetter off the court? Well, Pooh Jetter uh, as a person on and off the court, I'm the same person. You feel I'm, uh, I'm a messenger and servant. You know, that's what I feel that you know, God has blessed me with um, to lead, you know, as being this messenger serving and making sure that uh, I love bringing people together. You know, um, uh, I'm from Gardena, California, right inside of LA County, right in the inner city. Um, I truly believe that Los Angeles produces the best athletes in the world. Um, Well, California, I should say, right? but now nah, I've been playing this basketball, um, playing basketball what, since I was five, you know. Um, you know, in my journey, <clears throat> it's a lot different from everybody, uh, I should say. Uh, you know, of course, you know, playing at, you know, the park and rec and, you know, then playing like, you know, AU, you know, in this time, like, this is like, ooh, 1996. Ooh, I'm letting y'all know my age, right? <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I'm 39. You feel me? So uh now just you know, just been hoping all my life. But uh I always want to let people know, especially in this world, I know other prospects as you and you know, especially from the states, you know, have these type of interviews. Like when we when it talks about basketball, it has to be something that you love, right? Yep. Um you know, especially as a as a as a young kid, uh young man a uh, young like boy or girl, especially at that time, like one thing that my parents didn't have to do was, you know, force me to, you know, play. You know, um, I was already outside at a young age, putting in that work, using my imagination, you know, and I always had that belief, you know, that I wanted to be a pro basketball player. Uh, I mean, Rob wrote that in my, you know, um, my info one time that I was put in my yearbook. I wish I could find that yearbook, but then, you know, that dream came true because, you know, um, you know, I just had that belief, you know, in God and in myself, you know, and of course, you know, I'm not, you know, six feet and this and that, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a five ten giant, you know, uh, I'm a general, you know, so, you know, I always tell people like, you know, my, you know, my story is tremendously different from everybody. You know, I didn't play AU. Well, I tried to, but I was on the bench, yep. you know, um, so. You know, I didn't play varsity my first year, you know, my freshman year, right? Like, I was on the freshman team, but not only because the varsity coach, uh, Coach DeWan Hurt, I went to Sarah High School, he uh, he passed away, you know, but, you know, um, he had a plan. You know, he didn't want me to play JV because the JV coach was a baseball coach. He didn't have his foundation. Uh, the freshman team coaches were his previous point guards who won the state chip, you know, Coach. Reed and Laverne, you know, he, they, he like, yo, you're going to play for them. But when I need you at, you know, later on at practice, then you could come on because, they, you know, they was loaded. So, you know, um, then I got called up. You never hear uh, people on the freshman team getting called up to, you know, to the varsity, you know, in the same year, you know, because I did have the talent, but he wanted me to learn. Right. So um, and I'm going to go into a lot of that, that learning. So by me not playing a you right. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I got introduced to Mil Palacio, who's a, a former, you know, uh, NBA player from my high school. You know, my coach her made sure that Milt was, you know, tremendously like in my life. Then, you know, I have Baron Davis. You know, Baron Davis, you know, I've been knowing him since I was 11. So I was able to get, you know, mentored. Then here comes Lucius Harris, you know, like Lucius Harris, you know, started mentoring me. You know, um, I went to the NBA finals when uh, New Jersey Nets played San Antonio. So I was around people who, you know, um, who I wanted to be, you know, I was around people who've been where I went, where I, where I wanted to go, I should say, you know, and, and here comes Jason Hart. You know, and Jason Hart, who I've been knowing since I was uh, 13, right? And our story is amazing because I already knew his family, you know, mm-hmm. and I always was like, you know, um, just trying to, you know, like, to. I saw I was around those four who have been where I'm trying to go, you know, and um, I was like, dang, I didn't really need AAU because I was getting the information of them and playing with my high school team you know, in the summers and, and, you know, and that's how, I, you know, got seen, got seen and, you know, and now, you know, I go to University of Portland, you know, and have an amazing career at uh, University of Portland. And, you know, my pro career started in 2006 and I'm going on, what, year 18. So uh, I know we're getting into my whole journey and all that, but man, God has tremendously blessed me um, and that which allowed me to, you know, it's hard in life, man, to do what you love to do, right? And get paid doing what you love to do. Like, like that is the hardest thing in life. And God has given me this gift uh, to, you know, continue to, you know, give him praise in my story. So. Absolutely. You, you started off very early talking about how you've had a number of mentors in your life, right? People yeah. who have actually right. showed you how to live out that life as a professional. What, what what are the, you know, the tips, the tricks. Now you get to play that role for, for Ignite, right? right? You get to help bring some of the young guys along and actually show them the ropes and, and teach them how to do things the right way, right? How important is it for athletes who are coming up to the pro level to actually have somebody like you or other people like you in their lives? Because I, I think sometimes we, we look at the draft and we look at the players coming in the NBA and we want to just focus on their skill level, their talent level, but their situation and who they have around them, I think is so yeah. important and something valuable. So why, why don't you speak on that a little bit and what you're able to offer these guys with Ignite? Well, even when Ignite was created, right, I, I remember getting that phone call, you know, from Sharif Abdurrahim, you know, from Rod mm-hmm. Strickland, from, from B. Shaw, uh, from Coach uh, Rashid Hazard, who's now a uh, head coach at Cape Town in the BAL, um, from Coach Farr. So I was hearing from people when they first created this. Um, I just didn't know what it was, right? Um, previously, they've been hearing about what I've been doing. And I've been doing, you know, player development as a player, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I've been doing that since, I would say, uh, since really, you know, since I, like, started playing overseas, you know, um, that's why my connection with Ukraine was so strong because, you know, I always was having the youth. I always learned that um, I always learned it's a Bible verse. You know, it says a generous person will always prosper. Uh, he who refreshes others will be refreshed. Right. And that's me. You feel me? Like that's I'm refreshed, you know, because I always, you know, got to the point where I, when I got to China, that's when I started seeing like, Oh, China works because, and my longevity has been there because I was able to make sure that the, that the Chinese players are getting better. So it was mm-hmm. times where, you know, um, and that's really normal. That's really like that's not normal for like, you know, uh, foreign players to go to China, right? Um, because we're known to, you know, in China to be these scores. You're supposed to score, score, you know. But um, marketing. The best part of marketing will, will always be word of mouth, right? And I felt that what I was doing in Shandong uh, in 2012, right? I, I was in Shandong for four years because, yes, I was producing on the court, but I was just making sure that, you know, my Chinese players from from Dean to Double K to Chicken to Wuka, you know, um, to these players, right? Like, mm-hmm. like th- these players started becoming all-stars. You know, and it was times I used to tell uh, the coach at the time, Coach Gong, 
I said, but hey, let me get the guards, you know, because in in China or in Asia period, you know, like they want to learn. Mm-hmm. That's all they want to do is learn. And when you put that energy, I never forget when uh, I played against Stefan Marbury my first year, right? And Marbury was like, hey, bro, you need to stay here. You know, like stay with this team because my first year we did go to the championship and uh, I did sign like a good, a nice, like, nice deal. It's like three years um, after that. But I was all about development, you know, mm-hmm. like, hey, yo, come on, you know, like come down here. They learning moves. I remember, you know, showing Ding. I know people in the world may not know Ding, but um, I was showing Ding like a between the legs hezzy, right? And he did a between the legs hezzy and the game ran to me and he made it. He ran to me like I did it. I'm like, bro, we got to keep playing. We got to keep playing. You know, but um, <laughs> but that's like when it starts, you know, and once that word of mouth goes of that he wants people to be better, you know, um, then that's how it flowed in China. But, you know, uh, the last five years, I've been diving deep, you know, into, you know, grassroots basketball in SoCal, mm-hmm. right? Um, my my brothers, when I say my brothers, myself, Baron Davis, Trevor Reza, Bobby Brown, um, you know, and Rico Hines, of course, that we've known through Baron. I met so many people through Baron, bro. Like, but the inner city when it comes to LA, the D Wrights, the Trevor Reza's, the uh, from Bobby Brown, who was with the Rockets, to mm-hmm. Dejon Thompson, to you know Andre Miller. Like, like we have, and Brandon Heath, who was one of the all-time leading scorers in San Diego State history, right? Shout, so, shout out to some greats in the game, right? Yeah. Right. So what, what I was doing was I was getting all the pro players from L.A., right? We wish we liked the pro players from the past, but it did this for us, right? So if it's Russ, DeMar, DeMar comes every year to what we're doing, right? Uh, to Russ, DeMar, uh, James, and we haven't had holiday yet, right? But all the pros from L.A., we come back together and give back information to the youth, right? Um, and that started to spark something else. So Peyton Watson, right? So when I first dived into this, Peyton Watson was like the first one who was like really started from here. He was driving from Long Beach. Long Beach is not that far, but Peyton Watson started to come to our workouts Monday through Friday, Friday right? Going into his junior year. This is the summer going into his junior year. Hasn't really... You know, you know, reached the, the the type of potential yet, right? We knew sure. he had game, so I started inviting him and his brother Christian, you know, to our workouts. You know, and people from Long Beach don't really be coming to LA like that. You know, that's a whole nother story, though. Shout out to Long Beach, but Peyton Watson. So when myself and Dev in the lab, right? Dev in the lab, that's my trainer. We like really got together. So yo, like, let's start developing the youth. Um, but then I had some European trainer, European trainers come, uh, Nico from Ukraine, Ukraine, Khans from Belarus, right? And I was like, yo, I I want the youth to start getting this information from the European uh, trainers now. Don't wait till later because once I got to Europe, the rules and everything was different. Mm-hmm. How we was catching the outlet and going, they was calling travel. Or oh, when we in our pivots. And we, you know, jabbing and going. They was calling travel. I was like, hey, yo, hold on. Let's start teaching them that stuff now. So by the time they get there, they could be better. Mm-hmm. So we started doing these training. And, man, Peyton Watson was coming Monday through Friday. He'll tell you. And he freaking blew up after that. And mind you, his AAU coach is Jason Crow from The Truth, right? He was playing with Jason Crow. Jason Crow, son uh, J2 is one of the best freshmen in the country right now for high school. We, you know, he averaged like 30-some points. So J. Crow was a pro. So when you start seeing Peyton, Peyton was around pros and getting information mm-hmm. from pros and better players. Man, that junior year, he took off. He took off. And now, voila, he was a 30th pick in the NBA, right, in the NBA draft because he started, you know, that I was part of that process of being in that village. But so now I'm, I'm sorry. So the development piece, the word of mouth started going and a lot of people started hearing about what I've been doing. And a lot of people know how, who, like who I am as a person. I always mm-hmm. want to make sure that I'm a better person than I am as a basketball player. Like that is my goal. You know, if I'm going to be this master and servant, I have to make sure that my character is on board. Right. And, um, 
and people started hearing about what I was doing back in LA, you know, and I got, then I got introduced to Mark Mitchell, who's at Duke, you know, Mark Mitchell is like in our camp and uh, Ethan Anderson, that's now Pepperdine, like uh, Dylan Andrews, who's about to be take over and be the UCLA point guard. Like a lot of things started like happening and people was hearing about it. So they was like, who is the one? So the first year I was like, so what am I? Am I coaching or am I <laughs> like, what am I doing? So when uh, Bobby Brown and, and uh, Jared Jack took that, you know, was the was the leaders of that team that first year with Jalen Green and Kaminga and them, um, I was able to see it. I was like, ooh, okay, they really playing. So that by the time the next year came around and, uh, you know, Jay Hart, uh, Coach Jason Hart, um, who has been one of my mentors since I was a young kid, right, he got the job. And, um, you know, then that opportunity came again. I said, for sure, I'm on it. And, you know, I'm now just completed year two. So um, so with Ignite, man, like, and I know we're about to dive into that, but like I said, that generous person who pro- well, that prospers, you know, you got to continue to refresh others. And that's how, that's what I was able to do with the Dysons and the Marjons and the Jadens, right? And yep. the Mike Fosters and the Fambos, right? Then this year you're having Scoot and CD and Leonard and Mojave and, and Afe, you know, so so I am the vet, you know, not just for Ignite. I was a vet for for the G League. I think I was a vet for the whole community of Vegas, you know. So you know that is the role of just making sure that they get the answers to the test, right? Like, yep, you know, you know, especially when it comes to these young players. Like, you make this decision to be this pro, right? <clears throat> well, here you go. You know, here goes the answers. You know, and Having somebody who, you know, like Coach Jason Hart, who's played in, you know, the NBA, you know, for, you know, over a decade, right? Like he's been there. So, you know, we're point guards, especially myself and him. So like our connection already been there, but, you know, what we trying to do for, you know, um, our prospects, but then having Coach CJ, who was a scout and, and a coach before, and, mm-hmm. you know, Coach Rob Baker, who's been that coach and been a scout with the Sixers, like Hakeem Warwick, who's been that pro player, and Thomas Scott, whose dad is Byron Scott and has been, you know, part of NBA staff. So you're surrounded, you know, on the coaching staff and the players, you know, it's not just six prospects, but then it's, you know, six experienced players, you know, yep. from the John Jenkins to the Eric Mikas to the Marcus Gray to the Cam Youngs to James Sutherland's, right, um, to Aubrey Dawkins before he – uh end up bouncing going to Turkey and the Jesse Govans and the Kevin Murphy's, you know, so, mm-hmm. um, you know, our squad, you know, is, is about giving back. Like, Which and is I hope, I, I hope teams in the NBA see that, you know, like that's what teams are missing. They're missing that person, you know, in that locker room, but they're missing that person on the court, you know, and that's why, you know, I, I love Jay Hart so much because, you know, he lets me be me. I can stop practice. Hey, what we doing? Hey, you know, so I'm, I, I can do, he gives me, he said, yo, be you, bro. I brought you here to be you, you know? So um, I am a player, but I'm also like a coach, you know, as well. I'm, I have the only role in basketball as being an actual player coach. I had a scout this year, you know, against the go-go. I wish we won, but I had that scout, you know? Um, and he, that's what coach Jay Hart let me do. You know, he let me get a scout for a team and, you know, and I'm able, that shows that I'm able to, you know, coach as well. You know, that's what Ignite is. Uh, Ignite is powerful. Ignite is just not for the for the prospects. It's for everybody that's associated. They want everybody to be better. And um, I want people to continue to know what, what Ignite is because I feel a lot of people don't. Absolutely. And we're going to dive into the Ignite program really with a lot of what we're going to talk about in this podcast. And of course, we're going to touch on some specific prospects. That's that's certainly a big reason why Pooh's here. But just before we dive into a lot of that, just really quickly, because you do have experience playing at a number of different levels of basketball professionally, whether that be overseas, whether that be in the G League for a number of years, whether that be at the NBA level. But for a lot of the people listening to this podcast, Pooh, a, a lot of them have experience watching the NBA, obviously, and they have experience watching college basketball. They're not always able to dive into the overseas film, or they're not always able to dive into all of the G League games. So I just want you to illuminate a little bit on the competition level and what's that like playing 
in some of those leagues because I do feel like, and you and I have actually had this conversation off the air, at sometimes that production and producing and performing in those leagues, it goes a little bit underrated to, to a prospect yeah, stock yeah. Or, or anything like that. So why don't you just touch on the competition level of some of these other leagues outside the NBA? Well, you got to think, uh, in Europe, like, the game is totally different. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's college rules, you know, in Europe. But you got to just think it's college rules with actual pro players, mm-hmm. right? And, and in Europe... You know, like you see why they're dominating the NBA, like because as young kids, like you have to be certified to coach, like you have to have a license to coach. And when I was in Barcelona in Juventus, right, um, and 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 other places, you see, like they have programs starting with the youth. The actual pro team has programs starting with the youth, yep. right? Like it ain't no AU. There's nothing like that over there. So, like the Maccabis or the Barcelonas or the Real Madrids or the Juventus, they have players. Actually, they're like in their program. I wish like the NBA can do this model as well, right? They have like ten years old and up. Yeah, ten years old, you know? twelve years old, fourteen years old. They're becoming pros. Yeah, and they're learning from pro coaches. Mm-hmm. The coach at that's at Juventus now. He was one of the, uh, or the one private previously, he was one of the coaches who had the 10, 11 year olds. Like, so I'm seeing, like, I'm saying, I'm like, yo, the development they're getting at this age, this, this not no homie basketball, you know? And like, just, I'm just gonna roll out and I just want, you know, like, I don't want you to be mad at me for coaching. You know, I, I want you to stay on my team. So I got your homie instead of like really like giving that type of discipline direction, mm-hmm. right? Um, so in Europe, as I was seeing <clears throat> with the national teams and this and that, like like they are really getting developed at this age, learning what they need to be learning. You know, fundamentals. The fundamentals is the one that takes it to another level. But you know, when it comes to, I guess I've been playing in, in international. I would say what fifteen. 15 out of my, well, like 14 out of my 17 years of career, in, in like career of playing. So, um, you know, you learn so much. They're smarter. They, they play harder. First of all, the fans, like the <laughs> fans are like that, that atmosphere that the fans present, like, of course, to what we have, like, you know, in college, you may have that, you know, the student section, everybody's a student section, you know, at the games, you know, go to partisan or, I go see what they're doing, you know, in, in the Pantanicos, Olympia, like, like the arena is filled with this, like, like how a student section would be. And it's like fans. So uh, I would say more of like the playing, it's just that foundation they've been getting at that early mm-hmm. age, you know, that creeps up to, into them being a pro. And that's why they've been dominating. Like they've been playing, ain't no AAU in Europe. Or internationally, I ain't none of that, and I'm not saying I'm not knocking AAU at all. But the type of development and the and the teachings they've been getting at a, at a young age. Now, do they have like our our, our handle and and our swag? No, nah, they don't have that. You feel me? But you know they do. They, but they are getting taught by you know s- some pro coaches at an early age. You know, and they are investing with these pro coaches. You know coaching these these young men and women in europe and that's why you see them rising and rising yep. because it starts with the youth you know and like i said like the play like they play hard you know like european coaches are like are really good you mm-hmm. know one of my best coaches i ever had um uh, from france you know philip Herve, you know and philip Herve, you know and i ended up you know going to Limoges in 2015 after my season in china and you know um I won the championship with with, with Coach Harve, you know, and the stuff that, that he was teaching me, I was like, dang, you know, um, because one thing I always want to tell the crowd out there, the best way to pass into the post, and Coach Harve told me this, the best way to pass into the to the post, you know, you know how you uh, go you go up and go low, or you know, you go low, you go high, right, behind the back behind the back pass is the safest way to pass the ball, you know, into the post, right? I, like, 
if I had a tutorial, I would definitely show you guys <laughs> how. I know y'all probably looking like what, but it's just a way of protecting yourself and you gotta really work on it. And Coach Herve was telling me just little jewels like that, you know. Um, but of course, you know, I me playing with the Ukraine national team, you know, I had, you know, uh, Coach Fratello, you know, I had Coach Mike Fratello, the czar, giving me bars, you know. So uh, the reason why I feel like I'm, I'm where I'm at in my career too, because I have some great teachers in Europe. Yep. Alexander Kesser from Serbia, you know, Tomo Mahorek, you know, from Slovenia, you know, um, you know, uh, so I, I had Aito, I had Aito, um, you know, who's a the, one of the most famous coaches, you know, in Spain, you know, I had him for a couple months in, in, in Malaga, you know, so, you know, but, you know, the, the basketball world and internationally, you know, it starts at a, at a young age and that's why their foundation is amazing because, you know, they have a foundation of fundamentals. So, um, and they just teach. And a lot of things that a lot of these, the youth would think is boring, um, they do every day, you know, and mm -hmm. it's straight, straight, you know, two line passings and this and that. Uh, it's a lot of things that goes into it, you know, but, uh, you know, I know why. I know why that, you know, international players are, are soaring, you know, are like, are like at a high rate because, you know, they've been taught early the right things. The, the, the game is as global, more so, really, than it's ever been. And I, I agree with you, Pooh. I think that's absolutely for a reason. And I do think that no matter the path that you're coming from, I think your game needs to be evaluated appropriately. And it shouldn't necessarily be elevated, whether you're playing in one league or the other. I feel like the competition level overall, globally, it's just at a point where it, it, it's never been. And that's why we're seeing so many different players and prospects come from all these different pathways, right? So I do think that was very important to, to shed some light on. And one thing, like, so with these prospects that's coming from, you know, playing in the EuroLeague or EuroCup or your challenge or playing in the ACB or playing in France or playing in Turkey, right? Like, like you got to think these young players are playing against pro players. Yep. They're playing against players who are feeding, who are trying to find ways to feed their family, right? Like that's always the difference between playing with pros and the college players. You know, a lot of those college players are not going to be pros, right? But the like when people were talking about uh, uh, my boy in Dallas, um, Jaden Hardy. No, 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 no. The, the year, the, come on! Oh, I can't believe I'm <laughs> I'm wearing blank. The, uh, the the main player for Dallas, um, Luca, Luca. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, my bad, Lord. You know, blame me, blame me. Like it's the time. I'm like Luca. Like <laughs> when Luca was Luca was in your league, right? Like Luca, man, like was dominating your league. Like he was dominating yeah. your league in ACB. We don't know that, but you know the GMs and all that know that. Like people, like like how like you booing? You're booing Luca. And this is the rising star in Euroleague, like, like no way, like people are not knowing the competition, like it's real, and the, and it's for ten months, right? Like I had I my had true development in Europe. I was getting so much better because of the time I was putting in. You know, my best year of development was when I was playing on an island in ACB in, in Menorca, like. Ain't nothing to do on that island. You know, I, I was, felt like Gilligan sometimes, you know, just being <laughs> on that island by my like, you know, the owner, the owner of that team said, Hey man, you need to bring uh, a woman over here. You know, you told me at the beginning of the season and, you know, I ended up bringing my wife and we've been together ever since. Right. So, you know, but I was, you know, with those coaches just developing and what they see, oh, it's, it's, it's some great training um all over the world and i'm not saying our formula doesn't work you know with the aus and this and that but you know um a lot of the times man they europe is getting an edge because of the coaching but mm -hmm. when you have these players that's playing in the euro leagues and acb and acbs and the euro cups and all that when you have these players playing in these league and they're doing well over there it's a huge advantage from the college players it is and what people are not seeing with ignite because ignite is new right 
I don't think they know how to really uh, scout us. I don't think people just don't know. And they're not using that same formula like, yo, we're playing against the best players, right, that were in college. Yep. Like we're playing against that. We're playing against call-up players. We're playing against players who are in the G League that could go to in like a, the next week and go and get picked up by a yearly team. Like we're playing against real pros. That's the difference. And I'm not saying that in college they don't have no potential pros, but this the we are pros. Like we are pro players. So when you see Scoot and and Leonard and CD, like like when you were seeing Jaden Hardy like go to work against the pros, like like what are we talking about? You know, like but I don't think people know like we get so judged, you know, like on like man, they're eighteen and nineteen. Like yep. what what are you expecting? Like what are you expecting? So the advantage that the pro players from these eighteen and nineteen year olds that are playing in these leagues. I feel do have advantage, you know, do have advantage, you know, and I want people to start taking it a little more seriously. So. Absolutely. So you, you mentioned it, Pooh. Let's, let's start breaking down some of these guys. So you can, let me get my charger. I'm sorry. Right quick. Let me get my charger. Let me get my charger right quick. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. No worries. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> we got a little bit of a break in, in the podcast. No worries. But as Pooh was talking about, we're, we're going to break in and, and get into some of these Ignite prospects specifically. So Pooh Jeter's been with the G League Ignite program. He's been within the last two years, and he's seen a number of pro prospects already come up, right, through the NBA ranks despite draft status. Some of the guys that we're going to get into, you know, the Dyson Daniels, Marjan Beauchamps, Jane Hardy, like who mentioned, Michael Foster Jr. These were guys who were with the program last season despite draft status they've already been able to find some success in some form or fashion, right? So, Pooh, you got to watch those guys develop last year, and that was sort of a prelude and precursor into what we got into this year and some of the prospects we're going to talk about. But how much growth were those guys able to display last year from, from start to finish? Your first year with the program, how much growth did you see and how did that sort of propel the program in a way to develop the guys that we're going to talk about from this year's class? Right. So Dyson Daniels, bro. Dyson Daniels, I didn't know, I didn't think he had it, man. Like when I when in September of 2021, right? Um, with Dyson Daniels, I was like, I don't know how to, like, you know, like, I'm like, ooh, like, I'm not judging. I was like, Rod Strickland knows what he's doing. Like, <laughs> he, he is a wizard, like, recruiting. And, and also, sure, if I do right here, they're wizards when it comes to, like, like, evaluating players. And especially, like, you know, Coach Jason Hart is a, like man, the way how they see things is like, oh, no wonder. So uh I get I get to ignite in September, right? So, you know, I'm starting to, you know, see the whole crew. And and that that preseason, like the practice preseason, that whole preseason, I should say, with Dyson, I'm like, man, he a point guard? Oh man, what are we doing? You know, because you know, his he had to work on his handle more. Like, and he'll tell you this, you know, like he was struggling. It was a struggle. It was a struggle for Dyson, right? Um, you know, I was like, dang, like, and that's one thing in Europe, you don't like our international, you really see, like, you don't really see them with that. And handles, we say bop, right? Like, you don't see them with that, with that handle, you know, like, ooh, he got to, like, you just don't see that in that development because I don't know, like, probably the development they have over there that people don't be dribbling, like how we dribble in the States, right? So, um, yeah, Dyson was struggling. <clears throat> Dyson was struggling, but you got to think. Once Dyson got to, got here, it went to a whole nother level because he was around Coach Jason Hart. He was around was around Rod Strickland. He was around Scoot Henderson. He was around mm -hmm. myself. He was around Jay. So he was getting the type of competition he was seeing. And you know, he ain't he ain't seen this type of competition, and this type of teaching. I feel you know. And shout out to. Oh, Australia, I'm not dissing. I'm not dissing, but it was, it's a whole, it's a whole nother level once he got here, right? <clears throat> and you just start seeing Dyson grow, like improve and improve. Rod Strickland would get with him sometimes, do some ball handling stuff. 
you know, and Thomas Scott, of course, was we'll, we'll focus more on that handle and getting that because he had that heart. Dyson yeah. has it. Um, on the defensive so end, wanna... you saw it from from start to finish, right? Oh on the God. defensive oh, end, he was he was arguably the best perimeter defender in the draft class last year. Right, a, a monster, right? And one thing I always want to tell the the world um, from like from the start of the season to January, like they're learning our youth, our prospects are learning so much. Mm-hmm. Like they're learning like a lot of things fast. So like I always tell them, I say, yeah, like do your notes for like, you know, showcase and all that. Do your notes for it around that time, but really pay attention in February, March, like in like mid January, February, March, especially at, after all-star break. Our prospects are a whole nother player. Like they're a whole nother player. They get it. So from Dyson, it was like, ooh, man, like, I don't know. But as he continued to grow, and one thing about what I want people to know about the G League, like other players from the G League would give our prospects some pointers after the game. <clears throat> I saw it. Hey, man, you know, this is what I saw. I was like, man, now this is a family. Like, because then now you're seeing them giving yeah. little jewels. Like, people don't know that part. Man, like, hey, you know, like, and that's the, like the evaluation from us players. And I saw a few of them get like, hey, yo, this is what I saw. Just Anderson was like, hey, hold on, man. Hey, <laughs> you know, especially the ones who were the pros, mm-hmm. the Moutiers, the Just Andersons, those are the, they was like, hey, hold on, man. Hey, you need to be working on, whoop. man, when you get that type of isms from the players, like, that's nothing but growth. But Dyson, it was then it got to a point where he kept on hearing the voices. He kept on hearing and hearing. Man, he took off. He took off. He did. Uh, Jaden, Marjan Bochamp. I told, that was my, Marjan Bochamp, Bochamp, I said, that's the sleeper. <clears throat> because he's been through things. He's been through things yeah. in life, man. And when you've been through things with something that you love, man, you're going to do whatever it takes to, you know, once you get that opportunity. And man, Marjan took off that first preseason game. He had three dunks in a row. I said, Oh, yeah, he got it. He the one defensively shooting. He just had to go through go through things. And that's why if you really pay attention to Marjan, man, he gives God the glory and praise because he's been uh, at a place we never been to, we've been through. You know, some have, of course, but he's been through a place and and he keeps giving God the praises and boom, he's like, you know, he he wasn't like everybody knew him from before. Then he fell off and then he got with Ignite. And, you know, we put that fire in and boom, put him in that situation. Jaden Hardy, I don't understand like like what the expectation was of Jaden. We, we, we had we had this written down. We knew we were going to talk about Jane Hardy and that and that whole story because you, and I, like, are, you like, and I are in agreement. I'm like, what were y'all expecting an 18, 19 year old to do? Like he averaged 40 in high school. And he averaged close to 20 in the G League. I mean, like, what are we talking about? You want him to be what type of player? <clears throat> That's why I was at the scout for him. Dang, what did y'all expect from him? Because just because what we just seen this season from Jaden Hardy, he's been doing that. Mm-hmm. He's been doing that all his life. But, like, what is it? Who he had like, this, this past season when he's been in, in the G League with Texas. Like, his shot chart was one of the most on, crazy on. shot charts I've ever seen from a player in my life. Literally the whole thing was red. Every single spot on the floor you could imagine was red. It was incredible. Right. But it was like, okay, he didn't have a good showcase against us. You know, I'm, I'm with us last year. His showcase wasn't – but the stuff that he was doing against teams, like I'm like, man, all you got to do – whatever team you go to, you just got to just coach him. You just got to just continue to coach him, mm-hmm. you know, and let him know, hey, yo, we wanted him to do more. First of all, Jaden Hardy is a creator. He gets people going. And I wish he could continue to, of course, show more of that. But that clip and scoring, man, nobody can, man. Nobody. He is a pro. I've been around pros all my life. You know, and if you ask a player, man, I would never forget the scrimmage we had against USA. We had a scrimmage against USA, um, you know, before. I think it was like after. It was after, it was after the All-Star. We had a scrimmage against the USA team. When I tell you he was going to work, he was going to work and, and scouts around. And I'm like, oh yeah, I know, I know my dog is 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 he's he's going, he's on that board now. You know, like 
speak, but he's a hooper. And I will never forget draft day, right? Draft day, I got a call from a team who, uh, who, you know, he was asking me about second round, right? He was mm-hmm. asking about second round. He was like, man, hey, what's your thoughts on, what's your thoughts on Marjan and, and Jaden? <clears throat> I said, man, get off my phone. I'm like, man, get off my phone. Man. I'm not about to talk to you about Marjan and Jaden in the second round. Why would I talk to you? But those are first round picks. Like Marjan and Jaden, that's how I'm looking at it. I'm like, man, who in, who in the world in college is able to have this type of value? Of course, they, people want to go into the shooting percentages. And then, man, this dude is a, a pro. This dude is a man. He should have been where he should have been. You know, if they did the draft over, I knew he wouldn't be you no know, 35th pick or 37th pick, whatever he was. If they did the draft over now. You know, um, do you do you just so, think it was a lot of the fact that that people the the right people didn't pay enough attention to those games in February and March like you talked because you 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 laid it out perfectly. So you said when these guys start the season in in around November, right? So you go November all the way through about mid to late January is when these prospects they're really trying to not only pick up what you guys are trying to run as far as scheme sets, they're also adapting to a higher level of competition in general. Go into the G League, and then once you get past those few months. They're a lot more accustomed to the program, to the playing level, to the fact that they're playing against pros every single night. Then you start seeing them take off. Well, that that period of time, as you mentioned, it's after the showcase, right? So if you kind yeah. of have already made up your opinion about a prospect, you're not paying attention to February and March. Well, Jane Hardy was putting up 28, 29, 30 plus point games. There's a big difference. There's a piece that you're missing in the evaluation. Do you think if the more of the right people would pay attention to those games? we would have had a different conversation about Jane Hardy and his draft pick. Oh, for sure, man. Like, and I said, like, Ignite is so new. I don't think people just know, like, they're not they're not putting into consideration that these young men um, are playing against actual pros. Let me tell you about Ignite, man. Like, like first of all, when we – if you look at G League versus G League, right, if you look mm-hmm. at those teams play against each other, like – who who knows what type of scouts are at those games, right? Uh, who knows? But when they play against Ignite, yep, their numbers are totally different, totally like like so because it's because they know scouts is at the games. Mm-hmm. They're on TV. They're on TV, and literally they're uh, on TV. They're getting they're getting the rising star spots now. Like they're getting exposure at All Star Weekend that like these guys weren't getting. Ignite is a showcase, man, and our salaries is different, you know, Ignite, our salaries is different. So when we're playing against G League players, man, it is, they're bringing their A plus against us. So when you see, like we're playing against their best, Mm -hmm. it's, I promise you, it's different when they're playing against other G League teams. Like they're more motivated when they see Ignite. Ooh, ooh, okay, man, we got Ignite. Who, Who knows who's about to be in this building because the GMs and everybody are watching these games. It's a showcase. That's just real, right? So, um, so when you, so always when you see ignite and it's not you all, you gotta remember that part. So when we're getting judged or you know about their performances, yes, man, they are pro players, man. You think eighteen or nineteen year olds is gonna come in and which they are very like they're very good though. But man, they gonna get cracked by G League players, man. They don't know who the Paris Bass are, or the Xavier Moons, or the Shaquille Harrisons, or uh, I'm missing so many more. Like, yo, know, man, these players are coming in to destroy. Like, these are actually these are call up players. Like, right. So getting that test every night, and then you see our guys do well against this test, right? Oh man, come on. Come on. So when I was seeing Michael Foster, who come on, Mike Foster, come on, man, he was averaging, you know, eighteen and ten. But I, but in the Jaden Hardys was averaging close to, you know, the twenty points. And you know, Dyson Daniels, man, like once I saw him click, man, once I saw Dyson Daniels click and get it, man, he went on a tear with points, rebounds, blocks. He was showing it all. Mm-hmm. Like my barking wasn't being a I wasn't able to like scare no more he was like man watch out but hey I'll never forget in practice last year right you know Jay Hart did the young and the prospects really versus the vets right man this was towards the end 
man, they put on a clinic against us, man. We couldn't see them. You know, like, it, but because they actually just like got it and the competitor wise, they was cracking us so much. And I'm talking to Dyson Daniels. Look, I remember I never forget in the game, somebody was talking to Dyson in the game. He said, man, look at the scoreboard. His swag was different. You know, he started, it became, it was a woo. And then we see a pick, you know, then you see Marjan first round. You know, I was very shocked about Mike Foster. Very, very shocked. Mike Foster was going against pros. Like and he was, he already was built and ready. Man, Mike Foster averaged a double double with us. But you know, um, you know what, you yeah. know what, he still got to play with with my Philadelphia 76ers squad, the Delaware Delaware squad. Hey. You know what, they won a championship. So I'm, I'm listen. Yeah. I'm not mad about it. I'm, I'm, I'm right. happy for my guys down there. But, but the thing about life, man, like when it comes to everything, as we get into our new class this year, um, you never can take God out the equation. Can't take God out the equation, man. You know, so whatever is meant to be, man, is meant to be. You know, you just, you know, even though we may have plans in our hearts, you know, at the end of the day, God directs our steps and we just pray, you know, that, you know, our steps is, you know, going in that, in the right direction, right? But in life, we're, we're supposed to experience things. And once you experience those things, you're supposed to share it, you know, so other people don't make, you know, that's that same mistake, right? So um, our group last year was monsters, you know, even the fanbos, right? The fanbo, like, you know, um, unfortunately, he kept on getting hurt, you know, but I said, hey, bro, go out there and go to China, you know, and where he's going to make his millions. You feel me? Like, go to China and do what you do. And, you know, you'll, be, you'll, get, you'll find your way back. But just don't stop. You're yep. 18 and 19. Go through things, man. I was happy Jaden was able to go through that, though. That lit another, that lit something else in him, you know. So one thing about life, God don't make mistakes. So when Jaden went 35, 37, it turned it turned him up even more. He like, what? 36 others? You know, like, okay. Okay. Like, okay, let's get this, let this, let's get this going. My bad, my thing fell. Uh, let's get this going. You know, and we was able to see him have big performances. He had to go through things, man. And in basketball, it's so much more than basketball, man. Like when when teams are about to invest in you, right? The intel is going. They that background and intel is is everything. So I want people to know it's so much more than basketball. Oh, 100 percent. Like these teams are about to invest millions and millions of dollars in you. They have to know who you are, right? So when you are when you think of dang, sometimes why people may slip or this and that, it's not about their back, it's not about their basketball game. It's about other things, you know. So you always gotta make sure. You stay clean, to stay clean, you know, and surround yourself with people, you know, who are, you know, doing great things and this and that. But with that intel, when these teams do these intels, they are talking to your teachers when you was in second grade and fourth and this and that. They're talking to, you know, that maintenance person who you probably been walking by the whole time and not knowing their name and giving them love, man, like, like treat people how you want to be treated. Right. So like, the intel part is huge. Yep. So I want people in that world to be like, dang, why this? And they, maybe they, like that intel stuff, maybe they come back correctly, you know? So um, I just, I'm just, I just wanted to say that because when people think about the draft, they just maybe thinking just about that, right? About the basketball part, man. It's, it's a game everything. played by humans, right? There's a human element right. that you can't take out of the game and, and you're a hundred percent right. You know, we, we see all these, these rankings and mocks and this and that on social media from a, a number of people who just don't take the human element into account. And there's just so much more that goes into this game than just what are the stats? What does this guy's jump shot look like? There's so much more to it than that. hundred percent. Right. Right. All right, so let's get into some of the specific players from this class because you got plenty of thoughts. This is a big reason why Ooh, we wanted to link on. up on this podcast and, and and do this. So we'll we'll start at the very top. So Scoot Henderson, right, came into the Ignite program last year, got great experience with you guys last year, then sort of took over the reins at the point guard position this year, currently mm -hmm. second overall. On my personal big board, can't speak for everybody's big board, but second overall on my big board. Yeah. However, uh -huh. there's been a wave of scouts and analysts who have, in fact, moved Alabama's Brandon Miller ahead of him 
in the rankings. And we don't need to necessarily make this as a Scoot versus Brandon debate or argument, but I just want you, Pooh, as someone who's been around him every day, to shed some light on what are some of the things that you've seen from Scoot over the last two seasons that you feel should make his case clear, excuse me, as one of the best players in this draft class. Come on, man. Like, we, we, we've we seen these last two years what Scoot has been doing. Like, we saw it. Like, come on. Like, let's let's be real, right? Let's be real. Like, I'll never forget my first time meeting Scoot. You know, um, it was in that workout, the first time, like, I met Dyson, I said before, but that's September in 2021. You know, I started seeing a 17-year-old do things that I don't see 17-year-olds do. And I had to stop the practice. And I'm like, man. I'm 20 years older than you, bro. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Man, the dude is the dude is chiseled. The dude yep. with hands, his speed, everything about him is like I'm like, bro, this is unreal. And then what he was showing in the games, you know, just seeing and you know he was at the, he was coming off the bench, you know, and having that feel and seeing and learning. He learned so much that first year watching Dyson and hearing Coach Jason Hart and with Rod Strickland. Of course, you know, he has an amazing family. First of all, his family is amazing, you know, and they did a tremendous job. And I'm so happy happy that I, I can say I know the Henderson family, right? Mm-hmm. You know, his moms and pops and sisters and brothers. Shout out to my – that's my family, right? So you see who he came from. And then when we got on the court, oh, my, like, man, Scoot Henderson is the real deal. Like he, what he was doing last year, I was like, okay, bro, they know you now. They know you. Year two, let's learn how to run a business. All right. Let's get people going. Even when you're not going, let's get people going. You know, because whatever team you go to next year, you know, it's the same situation you're going to be in, like, you know, this, this past season. Like the same seat is the same situation of you yeah. getting people. You got to learn how to run a business, right? Make people better. That was my whole focus on school. Like, we know Scoot. We know what school can do. But what people need to know is he's a better person than, than he is as a basketball player. Character is amazing. Like, who he is at this age, man, this dude, this dude knows it. And what I learned so much is I love so much what he was doing off the court. Like, his personality started getting better. He was shy last year. He didn't want to be in front of the camera and this and that. That last day at our banquet, man, he got that camera and he, it was his show. And I said, "Ooh, he getting it." But you know the you know school and Brandon thing. Like Brandon Miller, my that's my dog, right? Brandon Miller was our first recruit, you know, to ignite. He was there. Like I got the chance to really. I was his host, and we still talk to this day. But you know, I get it, man. Brandon Miller had a great season, yes, you know, he did. but. It gets to the time. It gets to the time in March. That's NCAA time, you know. So they gotta market somebody, you know, and they gotta like. So they have to like. It's just part of the game of being in the Final Four. They have to market somebody, and that's when in March at that time you start seeing, oh, Brandon Miller out of all times, Brandon Miller in school, like doing the NCAA tournament. So they had they had to create that. I get it. But I'm already preparing. I'm already. We're already preparing school, man. If it's two, three, or four, man, you control what you can control, bro. Man, don't even go and dive into that. If you are the number two, first of all, we all dreamed about being number one. Yep. Right. That's our dream. We now, who knows what that? That whenever we hear who's gonna get the first pick, who knows, man? Like if it's gonna be Victor or gonna be school, man. Who knows, man? Like, but you know, of course, you know the obvious, of course, of of Victor, and, and I, I hope everybody watched the game when Scoot played against Victor. I hope people really watch what they both were doing. Man, we were seeing generation right there. That's generational talent. That was so a that franchise that game. Player. I would say for about eighty-five to ninety percent of the game, Scoot was actually the best player on the floor ahead of Victor. And then Victor had, he he had a last quarter where he ended up getting it going and he turned it off from a shot maker perspective. But Scoot, Scoot was actually given Victor the business. And I, I think that it, it's not that, it's not that we shouldn't put too much stock in, into one game, but that was, I feel like an important game for both of them. And Scoot did every right. single thing in his power 
to to give them the business in that game. I I, I want to ask you a question, Poon. I don't I don't want to sound ignorant to a degree when I when I say this, but I, I just want your thoughts on this. So when mm. I watch Scoot Henderson and I watch them the whole year with Ignite, and I and I break down every single aspect of his game. You know, I'm I'm looking at some of the missed shots, and I'm looking at some of the turnovers. I'm looking at some of the mistakes he's making. But when I just watch Scoot playing at this level, the game the game never looked hard for him. And that's what I mean. I don't. I don't want to say that like ignorantly, of course. But like you, you can speak on it better than I can. You're you're playing in that league for crying out loud. But it the game never looks hard for him. And I feel like when we're trying to look at who you would want to take near the very top of the draft, when you're looking to who to take second, which in reality, if you're taking somebody second, if if Victor's not in this draft, you're essentially putting a stamp on it. Like this is who I would probably take number one. In, in another draft like when you're making an important decision like that i just feel like that's something that needs to to come into play when you're playing at an elevated level ahead of college in between the nba and college and the game doesn't look difficult for you that speaks volumes to me and it's why i'm not taking scoot number two off my board can you add a little bit to that well you gotta think man like <clears throat> like these are 18 and 19 year old hoopers right yeah that made the decision to become a pro player right so like life is all about experiences man like like we've seen what school can do like right and of course like people be like oh wow like his three-point shot man you like tell me the numbers of rookies coming in now what is their average of three-point percentages the, 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 the average is usually of players coming in, it's usually sitting around like that 30, 31% mark, which is lower than okay. I think people would would think. Now that's factoring in some other things, but usually it, these guys coming in, the average three-point percentage is not around that 34, 35%. That's the league mark in the NBA. It's lower than that coming in, 100%. Okay. So I don't know why we keep on talking about three-point shooting. Like rookies coming in, that's something they for sure going to keep on working on. You know, and Scoot has two years of being at that line. You know, I was just telling somebody else, I said, why don't they just make everything all the same? Like, why does high school have a line and college have their line and NBA? Like, why don't you just make all the NBA lines? Like, and, and just hadn't that just then, and then we want to see the increase of three point percentages. If it's that important, then let's have them start early then so they can get used to it. So by yep. the time they get to the league, you know, they money more. But it's pros. It's all about reps, right? It's all about reps. So when we're looking at Scoop, man, like, well, dang, like, he turned, man, look at the talent he's playing against. You feel me? Like, he's playing against some great talent, and he's also going to work against his talent. You know, like, I would want him to be better defensively. I feel he gets bored. You know, like, I feel he gets bored sometimes. You know, and, and that's when, you know, uh, People may have that type of comment that you would have, you know, like, of, dang, why? He is the real deal. We're looking at a baby Russ, right? We're looking at a, a D Rose. I like to say he's a Jason Williams at Duke, you know, like, okay. I look at him like that. You know, I look at that. I see a Eric Bledsoe, you know, I see a Colin Sexton. Like, I see a whole mixture, but like, well, I'll be thinking, I'll be like, yo, Jason Williams at Duke was that man. I look at this built and physical, how he was going downhill. This and now Scoot is a whole nother version. And Jay Will, if you see this, what's up? You know, like, but I tell people, like, let's not forget how Jason, I think Jason Williams was what, maybe the third pick, second or third pick in that draft? Mm -hmm. You know, coming in. So, you know, like, but of course, man, he's 18, 19, 19, bro. He's going to have, he's going to continue to grow. You know, and 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 that's the job of that team to continue to bring them, bring them around the right people, continue to develop them. But we already know what he's doing, man. It's no other player better than him, man. No other. Like his built and his readiness. He, man, he got even more better with his reads. I was seeing things like yeah, I think in, I'm seeing things in practice as well. You know, like so his reads is even more better. But he's experiencing. Come on, world. Like, we know, like, don't let's not get into that, whatever. But at the end of the day, once we find out the orders of the draft, right, that one through 14, when we find out the orders, 
you yep. know, then we will be able to know what's the, you know, what's the fit. But come on, like everybody, everybody, everybody should have school number two. But I get Brandon Miller had an incredible year. You know, I rock with my boy. I, you know, we talk on uh in the DM. You know, we be talking still. You know, and I told him I'm I'm proud of him as well. But you know, if he's number two, hey, hey, Michael Jordan was what pick? Michael Jordan was number three. So three? there you go. So Scoot's you three. Know, Kobe was. Kobe was. Three. Man, like it, it don't matter. It's it's all about what you do after that, and that's what people need to understand. Like, yeah, the draft is a draft, but it's about what do you do after that. You know, and the so, situation, like right? So, like, let's say, let's say, Scoot doesn't go to an advantageous yeah. situation in the NBA. Well, I, I think you would say you trust Scoot to work through a situation like that, and you would trust him to be the best version of himself, regardless of where he goes. And that that's not always the case for every single player, right? You would you would know that better than I do. There's that's not always the case for every player. So, just being able to bring in that type of young man into your organization, to me that would be valuable to be able to draft somebody like that. But that's that's just my opinion. Come on. And, and he's, bro, we've seen it. Like, let's, like, go back to, and you can you see what Scoot has done, man. Dude, downhill, his mid-range, getting to, bro, he has it all. So you're looking at a baby Russ, you're looking at a D Rose, you're looking at an Eric Bledsoe, you're looking at that Sexton mentality, and you're looking at that Jay Will from Duke. You know, and we wasn't able to see the J. Will at Chicago because of his accident. Where here comes Scoot Henderson. Yep. Here he comes. So So we we we've talked about Scoot Henderson and everyone's talked about Scoot Henderson, right? And you know we had to hit on it on this podcast, but we want to talk about to to sort of close out a portion uh, of this pod. We do want to talk about the two guys who aren't getting enough love. And in both of our opinions. Let's go. Let's Both of our go. opinions. So I'll start with Leonard Miller, who has hey, come on. Leonard's now. been starting to rise up some boards, right? 6'10 forward came to ignite after having played high school basketball in Canada. Last scouting cycle, he 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 was he declared for the NBA draft. He went to the combine. I gotta be honest with you, Poon. I, I said this to you off the air. Last year, I didn't even want to have him top 45 on my draft board. I thought he was very raw. I thought he showed up to the yeah. combine. He did not play well in that game, but he didn't. When when he made the announcement he was going to ignite and he was going to spend another year to prepare for the 2023 draft, I looked around at some of my guys and I said, "You know what? This this is a brilliant move. Right? Go to a program that's going to show you how to become a pro, show you how to elevate your game to fit in at the NBA level." so that you can find minutes to play on an NBA floor to develop other parts of your game. And we'll see where he's at coming into the 2023 NBA draft. And I got to be honest with you, Pooh, my impressions of him now compared to where they were at last year, it's, it's a 180. It's a completely different story where now I'm looking at him as a top 20 guy. And I think there are some, there are some situations in the lottery. You look at some of the teams that are projected to have lottery picks where I look around like Oklahoma city, for example, and I go, you know what? He would make a lot of sense on a team like that. So now, like, the point that I'm trying to make is we're having a completely different discussion now about where his draft stock is. And and I just want you to talk about Leonard's development with the Ignite program and sort of how he, he to me, he really adapted his game, right? He started doing a lot of the little things. He started to really fit in as a role player and look at what it's done for him in, in, in a year's time. Just talk about Leonard's development and, and what you can see for him moving forward. I agree, and I agree with you. Um, Leonard came on a recruiting trip, you know, with Ignite, who was his host. Your boy, Pooh, you feel me? I was his host. <laughs> and, um, and you know, uh, I made a promise to, you know, to him and his older brother and his mom, right? You know, we made, yo, bring him here, you know, um, and let's really, you know, take him to that an, another level, right? Um you know, he was in the Canadian League, you know, doing that. I, I never played in the Canadian League in high school. I never, I don't even know what's going on. But I know he was doing everything, right? He had a, he had a, a good, he had a pretty good hoop summit, correct? Um, quite he quite literally did summit. everything on that. Yeah. He was trying a little bit of everything on that Canadian tape, yep. Right. So, um, i never forget uh, Section 7 last year. Uh, I saw the head coach of Arizona, Tommy Lloyd, who I've been knowing forever. 
You know, I used to go against him when I was at Portland. He was at Gonzaga, right? And um, <laughs> he said, man, you guys are getting off. You got Leonard. Now you're in the portal. You're getting Afe. I'm like, whoa, man. Because he was after these guys. And he's a great evaluator, right? He knows talent. So when I was hearing him say that, I said, ooh, we got one. We got, we got, we got the one because he got, he has a good eye of talent, right? So Leonard comes in and in the beginning, of course, he's learning so much. You know, you know, he's coming from, you know, one thing about Ignite, I want, like, we reward you for what you have done in the past, you know, we give you a nice salary, we reward you for that, right? When you get here as well, too, it's like, okay, we're going to add more things to that. We're going to show that, but we're going to add more things and put you in a position where these teams want to see you at, right? So that's why I, I tell people when it comes to Sharif Abdurrahim and Rob Baker and Coach Jason Hart, of course, like these dudes know what they're doing with our prospects. <laughs> and I know I'm, I'm going to get Jay Hart on the line too so you could talk to him about that. So Leonard, we were seeing – now I'm, I'm seeing a Lamar Odom. I'm seeing a Lamar Odom. I'm also seeing a Darius Miles, right? I'm seeing that. I'm seeing a, a Vanderbilt uh, motor, right? I'm seeing that. So, but with Leonard, I think that's if you that, look that last it, name you just threw out right there. I think that's an important name because he he came into Kentucky, right? Didn't get a chance to show everything right. he could do at Kentucky. Had to go through the the ropes, moving his way up the pro ladder, and now. You're seeing what that level of athlete, what that level of strength, physicality, what that motor can do for a team who's not only trying to get better and and, and get a playoff spot in the Lakers, but the Lakers are trying, they're with LeBron and AD. They're trying to win a championship. And you're seeing Jared Vanderbilt compete and, and help that team get to that type of goal. I mean, they're going to move on. They're likely going to move on and they're going to keep going to the playoffs, but he's able to play that type of role. And having that type of guy on your roster can, can that can change the the outlook for you a, a, as a franchise. Right. And it's it's not the sexiest you know name you can have or the, the sexiest role you can have from from a player who you're drafting. But those guys are important. You have to have those guys ready to come off your bench and come start. On. And 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 with Leonard, Leonard is really six ten, right? Like, and, and even in the beginning of the season. Man, like he was learning, but he's learning so much. And but we're starting to see through actions um, that he's understanding, right? And he's still learning, man. Like this is a development. Like yep. you always got to remember, the G League is a development league, right? Like so, like let's not think about that. Like like let's not forget about that development league. I challenged Leonard this year. Challenged him. Um, it was at a point in the beginning. You know, uh, he was, you know, in warm-ups and practice, boom, boom, dunking out, boom, boom. In the games, he wasn't dunking. I said, hey, bro, hold on, man. You teasing too many people. Stop all that dunking in his warm-ups. Stop all that. Like, we don't want to see that. We want to see that in the game. Mm -hmm. And at a point, he had, he had like, he didn't have no dunks like that in the beginning. Next thing you know, he started dunking out. And when I feel he could be dunking even more, like he could be doing, like, things even more. But with Leonard, hold on, Ethan, hold on. Um, but with Leonard, right, Leonard, we're talking about a, who averaged 15 and 8 in the showcase, right? That's November, December, you know, 15 and 8 showcase season. If you, regular season, Leonard, I think, was what I, I believe it came up to like 16 and 11 or 18, or 18 and 11, maybe. So you he know, was seven, essentially 17 and 10 in the regular season, 53.6% uh -huh. from the field, 30% from three, 79% from the line, led to a 19.8 PER and a 63.3 true shooting percentage on the year. Those are pretty good now, numbers. Pretty, pretty good. Like <laughs> pretty good for an 18 year, 19 year old. Pretty good. Now, as I look, Man, we are talking. Look at the last thirteen or fourteen games. Look, everybody, if you go look at the last thirteen out of fourteen games, the last fifteen games, thirteen of them were double doubles. Yep. Like Leonard Miller, go look at his like a roundup when he's playing the four or five. Man, watch out! Watch 
out when Len, like Leonard. So when I'm seeing, so when I'm seeing the people who are ahead of him, you know, and these are some good players. I'm, I, I'm, these are some good players. But like I asked you, if you put Leonard Miller stats next to Jay Walker's and Cam Whitmore, everybody had a great season. I'm not disrespecting nobody. I'm not. But I just see those are the, the players who are similar but higher than him in these mocks. I'm just talking to everybody in the mocks. And we do not put their names on their stats, right? So I think uh, Leonard, we just said his stats, like 17 to 10, you know, 55 from the field, I think around 32, 80% from the free throw, right? Then you have Jay Walker stats from Houston, boom. Then you have Cam Whitmore stats from Villanova, boom, right? Their names is not on there. Their names is not on the paper. Mind you, both are playing against tremendous, great talent, but Leonard, once we, like how we talked about before, is going against pros. And if I, I wish I could show everybody the huge list of players that he was going against every night and then even in the, in the practice against pros. So he's getting that whole pro experience from September to mid, the end of March, right? Whose stats are you going with? Are you going, like, if and if nobody's name's not on there, people are going to go after that person like, dang. And once they find out who it is and against that level, what is wrong with that? What is wrong with a 19-year-old who really showed that he can really hoop 17 and 10? against pro players, a person who has an incredible motor, like I, can, I can't believe when I be seeing these mocks. I'd be like, how are people really putting, that's what I ask you, is it really production versus potential? Like, like what's more better? Like, it's cause it seems like people are just going after, they're not really looking at this high production from this player against this talent. I'd be like, yo, like that's Leonard Miller is top 10. Like Leonard Miller has it all. He can do it all. But his production at this high level, like we're not really, I want people just to be real. Like, so what is it? It's production or is the potential? And I'm not saying that the others did not, and I love their games. Let me say that drive people that's about to be out there. I'm rolling with <laughs> Walker and I'm rolling with Whitmore. I'm rolling with their games. But when you add Leonard Miller to it and you see who had the better season, like, come on, man. Like, I, I just feel ignited just getting judged way too hard, bro. We getting judged way too hard. And I want people to really look at what Leonard was doing this whole season, but the last four, he had 18 and 21. That like 20 he, plus like rebound his, game was ridiculous. Yep. So here, so here's like, the thing like, too about, about Leonard, right? So he, he's listed, right? Listed. I don't know what he is today. He's listed at 6'10, 210 pounds. You can't tell me that dude's not going to add another 10, 15, whatever it is, pounds, and he's going to get so much stronger in the program. Just give it another two to three years. He's going to get so much stronger to where he's going to fill out. He's probably going to be playing more of that five role. So I, I, I think, Pooh, to, to answer your question, I think it's there. there's a certain baseline of production that I think a lot of people want to see met. And then it's about projection as to what are you going to be in the NBA? What is your best role in the NBA? And I think when, when you took a look at Leonard Miller last year coming in, I think a lot of people saw the very inventive side of Leonard. They thought he was going to be – we're projecting him as this, this big wing, more of this creator type, right? Well, he actually modified his game to where you can see him playing not only the four, but as you and I talked about, he can. I think he's going to be a five. And it's not that you want him to be a five for like 40 minutes a night, but if that's the type of role that he can play with, with certain lineups out there, that changes his projection completely because now you don't need him to shoot five, six threes a game. Now you don't need him to do a lot of these things that people are scared about with his game and it comes back to the rebounding it comes back to the motor it comes back to the defensive versatility it comes back to the finishing which all of those all of those numbers as a 19 year old in the g league if you look at the synergy percentiles he grades out well 
enough in, in, in all of those areas. So it's about, I think that that's the biggest thing about Leonard Miller's game that changed with you guys. And what I think more people need to start paying attention to is let's, let's let that idea of what we thought he was going to be just kind of sit off there for now. Let's embrace who he was this year and let that tell the story of where, where we feel his role is going to be best in the NBA and, and what his projection can be that though that's my two cents on, on Leonard and that that's something by the way Pooh, I had to fight myself with as well I had to I had to struggle and and really wrap my mind around those two different identities and see that well this is where Leonard's at now this is how I should evaluate him I had to come around to that myself it's 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 not easy it's not easy but I think once I did that my opinion on Leonard changed for the better but people just got to pay attention more. You know, that's all. That's all. I just want people to really pay attention more to Ignite. You know, and of course, I know, like, but we're used to watching college. <laughs> like, I get it. Like, yep. I'm a product of college. So I'm never going to say college doesn't work. I'm a product of college. You know, and I was able, I'm still, now I'm about to enter into my, into my 18th year next season, right? Like, so college works. But this is new. Like, so people not, like, especially being in the States, like, this is new. So, like, they don't know how to, like, really, you know, um, rank it. They don't know how to draft. Like, they don't, I feel they don't know how, because we get judged so much. It's like, oh, like, that. they just probably look at a couple games. But if you saw Leonard Miller last year playing the three and doing these things at the three, then you can look at this year, he was doing these things at the four and five. It's like, whoa, dang. Like, so when it comes to like, yo, like, like, look what he just did. Look yeah. what this 18 year old yeah. ATO just did against this talent. Look at the last 13 or 14. Like, I keep wanting to say it. The last 13 or 14 games, he was averaging high double doubles. Like, so, like, so when I be seeing this, I'd be like, he's a fit for anybody out there between four to 10. He's a fit. He's a fit. He could do it all. And yes, the, the wherever team that gets him going to add more uh, strength to him. But you about to get a gamer. I know. I know he's with Bill Duffy too. So Bill Duffy and them about to do their work. So mm -hmm. like, I know the mox is the mox, but Bill Duffy's gonna do what he do. You know, and um, and I'm so proud of what Leonard turned into. Like really, he accepted this role of like I'm like, bro, look at your numbers at the four and five. You know, and when you get that ball off the break, you push it. You know, like you could do that. You get that ball, you could push it and, and be you. But that four or five is your lane. That's your strength. You about to make that money. If now if he gets that pivot work and get his shot going, now I know his game may look weird. I know his game may look a little weird, but it is amazing, incredible. And of course, he got stuff to work on. Like, come on, like you think uh, I think he could he's I think he's to... got massive value working on not only being a better role man, right? Being a better screen setter when you get him into those actions, but he right. ran he ran 19 pick and rolls as the ball handler to me, which was very interesting. I think that's another aspect of his game in the half court. You have him working off of another player setting that screen, like him and Eric Mika just started to develop uh an interesting Ooh. relationships when they were running some of those pick and rolls. And I, I saw the vision as this big guy who maybe you set a screen for him to get him free and you have him come down towards the top of the arc. You have him working off somebody else in, in a screen roll action. There, there's some like there's some interesting stuff that you can start having him work on that as as he gets more comfortable with the jump shot, there is another upside to, to Leonard. But effort. You can't question the effort. Can't question like, the motor. No, can't question, motor was a leader. Can't in, question in the, the effort. Age, yeah. Bro, his re he rebounds. He rebounds, and I'm not saying nobody else. When I talk to about the other ones who's ahead of him in Mox, I'm not saying they don't do that. But the way how y'all treating our ignite players, my gosh, like man, like, and I'm around it, like I'm around pros, like, and I, like I said, I'm not saying the ones that y'all saying ahead of them are not pros, like they are pros as well. You know, you get it. People can take things out of the kind, like, man, I'm not saying that, right? I'm saying. Y'all need to start bringing our players to the party because they've been boogieing. They've been dancing all year. They've been dancing all year. So when it comes to Leonard, and I know we about to get into City. Yep. Oh, 
Let's just let's just get let's get in the city. I know you you've been you've been very generous with with your time, Pooh, and I know I want to respect that. But we do have to to talk about city real quick before we get out of here. So another guy who he came over to the Ignite program. He definitely improved with Ignite. I don't think there's any question about it. Six foot seven, two hundred pound listed wing, played twenty nine minutes a night, almost thirteen points per game, three rebounds, four assists, almost forty six percent from the field, another thirty percent from three, sixty four and a half from the line. 10.8 10.8 PER, 57 and a half true shooting percentage. He is, he's a very interesting prospect, but very interesting. I have a first round grade on him. I am a little bit more concerned with City, however, than I am with, with Leonard. And maybe you can be like, Nate, stop it. We're, we're going to talk through this. I'm going to help you out with it. I am concerned about his shooting. And I know you don't want to make everything about uh, shooting with the young prospects necessarily. Here, so here's here's my thing with City, right? To me, the fact that he actually got to some of the marks that he did, including the thirty percent from three, it it's 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 a little bit miraculous to me. <laughs> when, so when I when, when I watch the tape, when I watch mm-hmm, the tape, mm-hmm. there is almost there is nothing that's consistent about his shot from shot to shot. When, when I'm looking at his shot on the tape, and I'm going, some of these some of the misses are are, are really bad. But then he has yeah. then then yeah. he'll make yeah. like three four in a row where mm-hmm. the shot prep is right. He's catching the ball in the right spot. He's he's using the taking up the right angle when when he's going through his follow through releasing the shot. He's not having that low release point on his shot. There's like strings of like these three four five makes in a row in some of these games where you go, if City's shooting the ball like this, on top of everything else he's adding to on the court defensively as an on ball defender, as somebody who you drive him off of his spot, he's able to make the right play and kick at the ball where it needs to go in terms of his live dribble passing. If you put all those elements together, then all of a sudden you're talking about him in a much different range than the back end of the first round. But I, I am concerned about the shot making from all levels. So maybe you can help ease some of those concerns. Talk to me about yes, some help this year. Hey, bro. So you got to look. Everybody needs to work on shooting. Everybody. Everyone, yep. Everybody in this, every so I don't even talk about shooting. City, <laughs> if you look at him shoot, if you look at him shoot, that thing is pretty. It's pretty. It just a lot of times it is short. And then we was working on that. City shooting is like that's gonna come. Like, I be wanting, I want people to know that. Like, like sh- if you look at his shot, his shot looks good. His shot looks good. It's just more reps. Just got to get more reps. But it was a time. It was a time. Uh, when, I think when we played Memphis. When we played Memphis. And then we play. We played two games against Memphis. We played two games against Iowa. In Capital City. Right? There was a stretch where he got. That percentage was lower from three. But there was, yeah, there was a stretch where he got really hot. And he brought that percentage right. back up. Right. So, so, oh my, like, so when, when it comes to, sh- man, we see that. That's a team is going to work on that, right? The team, that's the team's job is to continue to develop. He just turned 19 on April 2nd. He just turned 19. So, development is all, but you see, as long as you see things. Now, one thing I didn't like, his, his free throw shooting wasn't, wasn't good, right? Like, like, I'm gonna always be real. I wish he would have had higher free throw because I see his form. Like it's his mechanics and everything is good, mm-hmm. right? But were we talking about his game? Like I say, like exit the shooting because all the draft picks need to work on shooting. All of them, all of them need to work on shooting. So I don't really talk about shooting when it comes to city, but I when I see city and what he did. He led the guards and wings in the entire G League. You talk about a player from Europe, right? He led the guards and wings in a G League in dunks. Top two, him and Jay Scrubs. They like so. Don't we can't say he's not aggressive. I'm just saying anybody out there. He, a 18 year old, was one of the leaders. In dunks in all of out of all the guards and wings. I forget the game what it was. We- there was one specific play I remember. He got the rebound, right? He was bringing the ball up in transition. Someone was trying to check him like at the three quarter court mark. He did it a, a crazy behind the back move, right? To get him going full steam ahead. 
and then he posterized somebody at the other end. And I was like, so that that type that that type of athleticism is is really interesting. But it's also right. also the ball handling and the coordination at that point at three quarter court to still be able to get that full head of steam against another defender like that. That was a special move and and a special play to look at and go. This is the type of player he can be in full court and transition. That's the type of wing NBA teams want in the roster. When I when we see City, right? We see a Lance Stevenson. I see it. Like I see a Lance Stevenson when it comes, like, you know, of course I'm like, you know, and City got handled. He ain't got handled like Lance, right? Sure. Like I see that. I see I see that. You know, I see a, a Evan Turner. I see it. I, I see a more athletic Kyle Anderson. Like I, I can see that, right? When it comes to City's game, but City passing, like the dude can pass. The vision, the like, vision he, on the move in the half court is insane. Some of the passes that he makes. So, Jay, uh, Coach Jay Hart, like we have, we have these terms. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we have these terms of, I think my AirPods went off. We have these terms of calling players dribble uppers, right? Like point guards are not point guards. Like I'm a point guard. I am a true point guard. But just people are some dribble uppers. Just, you know, get us into something. You know, not really point guards or this and that. We don't can't even use this label no more. The new term is dribble uppers. Salute to Coach Jason Hart for that, right? So, when, when we're seeing like yeah he could he could get you in the, like city can can do it all right he's ready strength wise this dude is a man he is strong he is strong I'm seeing him back down he's backing down like like other strong people like it's like so at this age like an 18 year old doing all this against these against these pros. Like being unselfish, you can put them in the system. I don't see a difference. What is the difference between him and Anthony Black? What's the difference? I think Anthony Black to me would be a much more comfortable pick and roll player right now, right? Like I, I trust him to make those reads for multiple levels out of pick and roll right now more than, than City. I, I see City as more, you get him going downhill, right? And he's one of these guys who you get him the ball and then he can redirect it really quick. That's I see him as more like a secondary or a tertiary playmaker as opposed to I'm going to have you run like 10 pick and rolls in a row right here at the top of the court. These are the results I'm going to get. I see that more for Anthony Black. But City, he, he, in terms of those two, once they get downhill in a secondary action and they're forced to, to make different reads off a live dribble, I do think there's a lot of similarity with them in terms of their passing. Oh, man. And I am a I'm a fan. I gotta say it. I'm a fan of Anthony Black. I was a fan when I saw him two summers ago. But he he's Vegas. not the best shooter like, either, though. To, I guess if you want to make comparisons, he ain't the best shooter either. <laughs> and that that is that is a weakness. He's gonna have to figure that out. And of course, like they all got to get stronger. You know, City is very strong, and I feel City is a better defender. City is a defender as well. That's why I he feel is. he has. He has that Lance. He has that Lance game, like a minus, like of course. But City got handled, but he don't have handle like Lance. I see the Evan Turners, like I see that in City. So when like City is ready, and I'm not saying nobody else is ready, but <clears throat> I'm seeing these other mocks, and I'm like, it's no way people are seeing the same thing I'm seeing. And I've been around pros for a very, very long time. It's no way I'm seeing that. Like I'm like yo, like how y'all how y'all seen like like come on world, work with me. Like how are we putting these type of talent that they're doing against actual pros, right? And I'm, and they were playing against their A plus game, and these dudes are right with them. Mm -hmm. They're right with them. So city, great season, Leonard. It's like, come on, come on, world, world, really dive in, world, really dive in. I don't think you guys are paying attention. I don't think y'all paying attention to the G League. You can't be. You're not paying attention and watching Ignite. Focus, because we have some players 
who definitely need more love. Absolutely. They need more love than what people are giving them. They need more love. Come on. Work with us. Work with us, world. We have talented players on our Ignite squad. And that was the thing with Scoot, right? Scoot, I say, yo, you already got what you're going to do, right? Who else going to join this party with us? Who else going to join the party to be in the first round with us? Let's make sure they get, get, on, the, get on that board with you. Let them be on the first round. Let them do what they can do. You know, so that's the part about being a leader. Make pe- get people paid. That's what you want to be known as. As you, whatever sit team you go to, yes, you can get be explosive and be you because Scoot is a he is ready. People are about to be like we ain't going we ain't seen this type of mixture of talent when it comes to Scoot, right? We haven't seen it. Trust me. I've been been playing against and I've been preparing for this for two years, you know, so it's another type of monster um, that we about to go. So, um, but when it comes to Leonard, when it comes to City, bro, pay attention, world. Like, go back. Go back and look at these (laughs) games. That's why I'm talking with you, Nate. Like, that's why I'm talking with you. Like, because the draft deeper, I'm, like what Rick Ross say, it's deeper than rap. It's deeper than hoop. It's deeper than hoop, right? So, um, like, really pay attention when it comes to to Leonard Miller, when it comes to um, City Sissoko, when it comes to Mojave King, you know? Like, when it comes to Mojave, like, I can't wait for people to really, like, pay attention and dial in. If you come to Ignite, like I want people to really know that. Like, ignite is all about development. Yep. Right? It's about development, and we are and we are picking. When I say we're, because I'm part of ignite family, but I know it's Sharif and and uh, and, and Coach Jason Hard and Rod. Like, they're picking these players who are ready. Like, so if you want to come to ignite, you have to believe in your heart, not other people. You have to believe you are a pro player. Mm-hmm. And what comes with this experience is going to make you even more better. That's why I can't wait to everybody see the London Johnsons and the Baba Cars and the Dinks that's on the way and the Matas. You know, like I can't wait for people to see this type of talent. And Cherry in NBA Africa. Like I can't wait for people to see this type of talent that's on the way. But Draft deeper, subscribers, everybody, pay attention to Ignite, please. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Pooh, this podcast was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for for coming on and and sharing your perspective with us. Trust me when I say, I don't I don't just say things just to say them, right? Pooh knows that. I'm not gonna gas anybody up for no reason. I'm gonna say. What's on my heart? I'm going to say what I mean. And trust me when I say the G League Ignite program, it's working. These guys are coming in. They're developing. They're getting better. They're holding on to roster spots. They're holding on to opportunities in professional basketball. To me, the results are there. And it's only going to keep growing with more of the players coming through the pipeline. So we we certainly appreciate some insight and perspective into the, the, the G League Ignite program. Pooh, before we get out of here, is there anything else that you wanted to plug and anything at all? We got the little man coming up. Anyone watching on YouTube? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. This is Ethan. This is my youngest. Ethan, he's four. He is on the way. Be prepared. I got another <laughs> one. EJ, that's eight. He, they are on the way. That cheddar game. Nah, uh, not nah, thank you, thank you, Drive Deeper, man, for like you know, Nate, for the whole like for having me a part, you know, of this amazing experience. Um, me being able to, you know, shed more light, shed more light on the whole ignite. I don't think people really understand what ignite is, um, but I'm here and I'm, I'm want to yeah. get Coach Jason. I want to get Coach Jason Hart on even more, you know, Absolutely. to explain because I think the world, I think the world just don't know. They just don't know. You know what ignite is, and uh, you know, Mm -hmm. and I'm just thankful to you know have the opportunity to be able to share the thoughts and hopefully get people more and better vibes of evaluating you know our prospects. 
you know, but Leonard Miller, City Sissoko, Mojave King, they're draft picks, draft picks, focus. But, you know, uh, especially on my end, of course, uh, you know, just, you know, go to prepare for year 18. If you're out there, please go. I have a shoe and clothing store. I want. I got to promote this. I got a shoe and clothing store in LA. We're the only black owned right now in Los Angeles with a Nike account, right? Uh, at Lace South Bay on Instagram. Please follow us. We have all the dunks and all the shoes that everybody wants. Um, LaceLifestyle.com. Go shop online. And um, yeah, like, and this is not the last time you're gonna see me with Drive Deeper. It's not the last it. time. I'm about to dial in and and I'm about to be a I'm part we a part of the Drive Deeper family. That's right. That's right. The Pooh Jetter's coming back. No Cylinders NBA Draft yeah. Deeper Part Two. We're we're gonna cook up this podcast. We're gonna get Coach Jason Hart on. So I appreciate everything that the program's doing for us here at No Cylinders. If you want more content about all of these prospects, about everything going on. You can follow us on Twitter at No Ceilings NBA. You can follow me on Twitter at Draft Deeper. Subscribe to this podcast and No Ceilings NBA feed wherever you get your podcasts. And until we meet again on this wonderful podcast platform, thank you all so much for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week.